Welcome to Represent NYC election coverage brought to you by Manhattan Neighborhood Network in partnership with the League of Women Voters of New York State and Gotham Gazette. I'm Ben Max, executive editor of Gotham Gazette. We're pleased to bring you interviews with the two candidates in the Democratic primary in the 73rd Assembly District in Manhattan. The primary is happening this month of June with early voting underway from June 13th through June 21st and primary day June 23rd. All eligible Democrats can vote in this primary and many others across the city for state legislature, Congress, and more, and there are a small number of primaries in other parties. Also, because of the coronavirus pandemic, the governor issued an order allowing all eligible voters to vote by absentee ballot in this month's primaries, so take advantage of that if you prefer. The 73rd Assembly District includes parts or all of Manhattan neighborhoods, including the Upper East Side, Midtown East, Turtle Bay, and Sutton Place. It's one of 150 assembly seats across the state, each representing well over 100,000 constituents, and the assembly is the lower house of the state's two house legislature, which also includes the state senate. All 213 seats in the legislature are on the ballot every two years, so here we are with this year's elections. There are two candidates seeking your vote in the 73rd Assembly District Democratic primary, and we're interviewing them separately today over Zoom. Joining me now is the challenger, Cameron Kaufman, who is attempting to unseat assembly member, Dan Court. Thank you for being here, Cameron. Well, thank you so much, Ben. Thank you to MNN. Thank you to the League of Women Voters. Uh, I appreciate having this opportunity. And I know it's obviously a bit of a, a weird election cycle given that so many people will be voting by mail. Many people have probably already cast their ballots or might have voted early at one of the three sites that's for our district. Um, but nonetheless, for those that has still not made their decisions yet. I'm excited to talk about my policies, my campaign, and my vision. Absolutely. So um, I'll have a few questions for you, then maybe a lightning round of some quicker yes, no, short answer types, and then we'll give you a minute closing statements. It's going to be a fairly short conversation, but I'm glad we're having it. As you said, it gives voters a chance to hear more from you and see you uh, answer some questions. So why don't we jump right in? You're seeking to become a member of the State Assembly. Uh, a, a, you know, a key piece of your campaign obviously has been tr the fact that you're trying to unseat an incumbent, but about you, before we get to your, your case against the incumbent, what qualifies you to jump to the state assembly? What have you done in the district that makes you prepared and deserving of being elected to the state assembly? Yeah, so, so I'm a lifelong resident of the district, very active and involved in this community, being brought up here on the Upper East Side. I grew up in Carnegie Hill, now live in Lenox Hill. And it's a community that's very special to me. I have a lot of ties to community groups. My temple, Temple Emmanuel, I'm very involved in with community action, as well as with All Souls Church and their soup kitchen. I think what's important about this race, though, and what's important about state and local government in general, is that we need people who are willing to listen. And I think that I've been doing that for my entire life, being a part of this community, being a listener. Um, and that's really been the major theme of this campaign, going to every single community board meeting, NYPD community council precinct meetings, going to town halls, uh, trying to really talk to as many people as possible. We've been out on the streets, obviously been a little different the past couple months given the pandemic, uh, but I can talk more about actually how we continue to reach voters through that. Another thing that I will say, I understand if people might be concerned at the fact that I am 23 years old, and, and that's obviously I'd be the youngest assembly member, um, and there's debate about whether it's since Teddy Roosevelt or since Dick Gottfried, but whatever the case, it's the youngest in a while. And the fact of the matter is, though, that the campaign has shown itself to be a very professional and very in the community in terms of if you look at the last few months, no one really would have been able to respond to this pandemic. But I am proud of what myself and my team have done, you know, in setting up mutual aid. We've given out now 3,000 bottles of sanitizer, 3,000 masks, been everywhere around the district doing that, setting up canned food drives. Um, so I do think that if people want to know what experience we have and kind of what I will look like as an assembly member, you can look to what we've been doing over the past couple months as evidence of that. And do you understand if there's voters in the district who say, I, I, you know, other than when you jumped into this campaign, I don't really know you very well. I don't really know your track record in the district. I feel a little hesitant um, giving you my vote as opposed to someone who's, you know, been in office quite a while, um, you know, has been serving the district a long time. Do you get that skepticism or how do you overcome that? Yeah, I totally understand the feeling. I mean, I would say that I do know a ton of people in this district. I, I said, lived here my entire life. I grew up here and have been very involved in the community. And I'm proud, you know, if you look at the hundreds of people who have donated from in-district to this campaign, um, shows the connection that we do have to this district. 
Um, and I think that the events of the past couple months have demonstrated that we need some change. We need new leadership because in many ways we do face a blank slate, a tabula rasa, in the way that a lot of our preconceived notions about the way that anything works, um, whether it's our city's transportation system, whether it's just how people go to work, whether it's our education system, a lot of those preconceived notions have been thrown out the window, I think. And so I think bringing in new people who have a different perspective from my generation will be beneficial to that. Um, so what's the, what is that? What is, so let's jump into that. I want to, I want to come back to your case against the incumbent in a, in a few minutes, but let's jump into that. Then you have this blank slate that you're saying in terms of a lot of um, need to start over, reinvent things. What is that pitch? What is your vision? What would you try to make sure is part of that reinvention if you're elected? Yeah, so I think that there's a lot of things. I would start with small businesses, which has been a major focus of this campaign. The retail vacancy rate was already very bad in our neighborhood before all this happened at about one in seven storefronts. I would think it's probably about one in three now. We obviously don't know, and you know, we're going to wait for the next kind of couple months to see that plan out. But this is really a major issue, something that's brought up in the community all the time. I think that, that we need to work with the city council to be aggressive in ways that we can, can get these small businesses back on their feet. So I think repurposing parking spots into sidewalk cafe seating as they've done in other cities, making it easier to get a sidewalk cafe, working, you know, the commercial rent tax, I see what place it serves, but I don't think that we should be punishing businesses right now, making it hard to set up. I think the state can look at business interruption insurance. You have companies that got business interruption insurance policies, and that was for some sort of loss of business that they couldn't control. So maybe a flood or whatever. But I would think a pandemic would be the exact thing that a business interruption is that you have no control over. The state telling you you have to shut down because people's lives are at risk, and yet the insurance companies aren't paying out these policies. So there's ways to go and have a massive overhaul on the small business front. And as somebody, we have a storefront office. We're on 57th and 1st. I think that's great to be an assembly campaign with a storefront office. But we talked to 15, 20 landlords about their spaces, about trying to find one. The fact that we got a deal is indicative of just how weak the market is right now. But we got to talk to so many people and say, has anybody been interested in your space in the past year, in the past two years? And the answer by the majority of people was no. Uh, so I think it's really an issue of demand. And I think that we need to work uh, with people like Andrew Rigi from the Hospitality Alliance to really come up with ways to make it easier to start up a business. And whether it's loans, uh, whether it's also looking at the tax burdens and then looking at the spaces, as I said, the parking spaces, the sidewalk cafes, we can do that. So a couple, let's, let's um, hear a couple other top priorities. You go to Albany in the state assembly uh, after being elected. What's the top of your list in terms of how you're trying to shape policy that comes out of state government um, other than small businesses? What are a couple other specific policies? Well, I would say our other two major things are climate change and ethics reform. So on ethics reform, I think that one thing that we have noticed in talking to thousands of people in the district that they're not too happy that the incumbent assembly member takes outside income. He takes about $125,000 as a lawyer representing insurance companies. Um, and I do think that creates, first of all, a conflict of interest. And some insurance companies do contribute to his campaign finance account. And you, know, you had issues with Sheldon Silver and Dean Skelos. There's been a lot of questions about outside income in New York State. Uh, and, and the lawmakers, almost half of them do it. Uh, I think that that's something you could do as Congress, cap 15%. You can also work to replace Jay Cope with an actually independent ethics authority, Liz Kruger, my state senator, who I really admire. I think she's tremendous, um, has been advocating for that, and that's a way to go about it. Uh, but I think that people really need to believe in state government again, uh, because we did see so much, and I'll give credit to the incumbent assembly member and to the entire legislature. I think in 2019, a lot of great legislation was passed uh, in having a democratic legislator, legislature and governor for the first time in, in 50 or so years. Um, and they passed tremendous things like the Reproductive Health Act and CLCPA. Uh, and so I think that's great, but I still think that there's an aversion that people don't think that Albany is fighting for them, that it's broken. So ethics reform and actual real campaign finance reform, and I wouldn't call what just happened real campaign finance reform. Mm -hmm. I think something more on the scale of what New York City has would be better than that. So uh, you bring up uh, in the campaign the assembly member's outside income. Mm -hmm. He points to your uh, lack of, you know, roots or, or work in the district. He points to ties, um, your ties to, to real estate. Um, you know, those are, those are the sort of the big uh, criticism law back and forth. How do you respond to, you know, when the assembly member brings up uh, your, your ties to real estate and questions whether, um, you know, as an assembly member, that would be where your interest lies? 
Well, first of all, because you did bring up my roots to the district, I want to make it very clear that the assembly member claimed that I was not a New York resident. Um, he made this claim. He sued me off, tried to sue me off the ballot for voting while I was in college. I voted on campus. And the first department said in a 4-1 decision that I was indeed a resident and noting all of my ties to this community. And if you can watch the oral argument, in fact, um, one of the key pieces of evidence that I interviewed, State Senator Liz Kruger on my campus radio show program, talking about the 2017 Constitutional Convention referendum, something that I thought was a good idea and something that Senator Kruger supported as well. Right, so, um, so that established on the, on the, on the criticism, right. the main criticism, yeah. Yeah, on the real estate front, I would like to, to acknowledge that Rebney, the Real Estate Board of New York, is supporting one of the two candidates in this race, and that candidate is not me. That RPAC is supporting one of the two candidates in this race, that candidate is not me. I would also like to acknowledge, if you look at the Schedule C contributions um, for, from, you know, from partnerships, there are about five or six real estate partnerships on the incumbent's 32-day pre-primary there are zero on mine, and that on Friday, or I guess tomorrow, and some people are watching this on Thursday, the incumbent will be speaking to Rebney. Um, we'll be speaking to Rebney members. But what, but what about your philosophy on development? Can you give us a little bit of um, just a, a general stance, you know, just in your district, not even, not even more broadly than that, what your, you know, what your kind of lens on, um, you know, development, uh, building bigger, rezoning, you know, whatever it might be, you know, what kind of, um, viewpoint you would bring to the assembly on, on development? Yeah, no, I mean, obviously a major concern in the district, whether there's people who want more development or, or, or less or, you know, down zoning, up zoning, but what's your, what's your um, particular lens? No, overdevelopment is a major concern in our district. You know, we opened up our office on 57th and 1st. There's the massive tower on 58th street. That's about 90 stories high, um, casting shadows, causing health risk, risk with the construction and, and really obstructing a lot of people um, in their day-to-day -day life with the noise. And this is all for a luxury tower. Uh, so I'm all in favor of development. I think that, that we do need to be looking at height. And that's something that's coming up as a city issue, obviously, for 3rd Avenue, 2nd Avenue, 1st Avenue, and York Avenue to install a 210-foot limit as we have in the avenues in the western part of the Upper East Side. And that is something that I would support. But I do think that more importantly, when we're developing, you know, our, our neighborhood has a total lack of affordable housing. And our neighborhood almost all new developments are luxury developments. Uh, and I don't think that that's the direction that we should be going in right now. Um, especially if you look at the, where this city is right now, I don't think we need to be building more pied de and, and second apartments for people. I think we need to be building good middle-class housing. Uh, all right, a few, few, few more things in our, in our limited time and I appreciate those answers. Um, can you name any votes that Assemblymember Cord has taken that you would have taken differently in the last uh, couple of years? Well, I would have voted yes on the budget this year. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big one. That, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I don't necessarily say it's his votes. Um, congestion pricing obviously was tied into the budget. So I don't, I just, I would never have co-sponsored and never would have been so um, in support of it as he is. And in fact, you're opposed to congestion pricing, right? Um, I'm opposed to the current scheme. I think congestion pricing is a very important idea. Um, as someone who cares about both the environment and cares about, I've noticed the congestion but drawing this line on 60th Street and then coming up with a way to credit the tolls back to people who are commuting in, but then actually hitting people who live in the 50s and 60s makes no sense to me. The traffic is not caused from people that go from 70th Street to a doctor's appointment and then when you come through. A couple of quick things and then a, and a, and a one minute pitch from you to voters. Um, do you agree or disagree with um, the police reform bills that have recently been passed and, and signed into law this, this last week or two? I agree with them. I, I think more needs to be done. Okay. Um, um, are you in favor or opposed to calls to increase taxes on some higher earners? In favor. In favor. And do you have an income threshold where you think increases should start? I think probably about 500,000. Okay. Um, but I, I know that's going to be quite a, a debate with the governor and everybody. So, uh, Do you support the New York Health Act for single payer health care in New York? I don't. I think we need health care reform, but I don't think that's the way to do it. Do you support the legalization of adult use of marijuana? If the funding actually goes to underserved communities that were hit really hard by the war on drugs, yes. Okay. And um, let's give you a minute to speak straight to voters here as part of this program. I appreciate the back and forth we've had. Obviously, it would be uh, great to have more time or even a, a debate with the assembly member. But um, why don't you take a minute with a closing statement and then I'll say goodbye. All right. 
Well, I do want to say that in the past few months, meeting thousands of people, I think the stakes of this election are so big. We're coming off of a pandemic and we're coming in an era of social change right now. I've seen my generation and many other generations, we've taken to the streets and we've demanded change. And as someone who has lived here my entire life and has roots in this community and has talked to many more voters than the incumbent assembly member has, has been out, I think that we need someone, someone new who wants to serve full time, who's not campaigning for district attorney at the exact same time, campaigning for higher office, someone who's put forth policy plans, about 75 policy bullet points on our website, someone who really cares about this community deeply and wants to do everything that they can to make it a better place. The stakes are really too high to go for the same old at Albany and to go for someone who is corrupt enough to try and sue me off the ballot during a pandemic, someone who's taking outside income, someone who, as I said, is running for another office at the exact same time. I'm really proud of my track record. I'm really proud of the work that I've done in this community. And I hope that people will take a chance on me in the next six days um, in my vision for how we can rebuild after COVID-19. Thank you, Cameron Kaufman. I appreciate it. Appreciate the time. A reminder to voters, Democrats in the 73rd Assembly District on Manhattan's east side can participate in this primary. And there are primaries happening all over Manhattan and the city where eligible voters in the relevant political party can participate, including for many other seats in the state legislature, the Assembly and the Senate, and the U.S. House of Representatives, among others. All eligible voters can participate in early voting, which is ongoing through June 21st, or vote at your poll site on primary day, Tuesday, June 23rd, or you can choose to vote by absentee ballot, which everyone is allowed to do this June. Please do vote if you're eligible. And thank you for watching Represent NYC election coverage on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I'm Ben Max from Gotham Gazette. Goodbye.